producers of this show, and I should tell you um, that they put together a book of some of the great pieces that have been read with that time of the month over the years. Um, obviously, none of the ones you're hearing today, but some that have been written in the past, and we have plenty of, plenty of copies of it up at the register. I think they can sign it for you. Um, Christopher Pilney is one of those producers, also known as Mr. Chainsaw Underwear Guy to me. <laughs> <laughs> He's also currently the managing editor of livability.com, and he is going to read us a story titled Five Moments in the Life of an English Major. And also thanks to Parnassus, Anne, and uh, Nikki, and Ginger for having us here today. This is a huge honor. Uh, I've been trying to do this for two years since I started pestering her, and really glad to be here. <clears throat> Five moments in the life of an English major. One. The first time I read Mark Twain, I was a junior in high school, and got about five pages in Huckleberry Finn before going online and ordering the spark notes. <laughs> it wasn't so much that I was lazy, I was. It was more so that I was just an idiot, in the literal sense of the word. And as I sat there staring at the 19th century American English, I realized I had no clue what he was saying. Of course, you can't tell your English teacher this, especially when the rest of your class and generations of students before you have read the same book and found it wholly digestible. Instead, I breezed through my spark notes, feeling fully confident in my comprehension of the text, before getting a B- minus on the test. I did the same things with the rest of the novels that year, finding Hemingway, Fitzgerald, and Steinbeck equally as inaccessible, and eventually deciding it was best if I just stuck to Harry Potter books. <laughs> I was certain I'd never reach an adult reading level when I stumbled upon Jimmy Buffett's memoir, A Pirate Looks at Fifty. <laughs> Well, this is my speed, I thought. This is something I can do. <laughs> two. Reading Buffett inspired me to do two things. Learn how to make pina coladas, and become, much to my parents' dismay, a country music singer. <laughs> this is how I ended up at Belmont in 2005, and found myself in an orientation group playing something called the name game. The premise is simple. Go around in a circle listening to people put an allergic adjective in front of their first names. Silly Susan, for example. Then, when it reaches you, come up with your own combination. It might have helped had I remembered what alliteration meant. Perhaps also adjective. I might have said something like creative Chris or crazy Chris. But instead, I thought all that mattered was that the word have a CH in it. And I went with Chainsaw Chris. <laughs> Long story short, I terrified the entire first wave of my <laughs> classmates. A group large enough to spread the rumor that I kept my victims in my mini fridge. I was moments from calling my parents and telling them I was transferring when one of my team leaders, a music and math major named Josh, said to me, you know what, I'm gonna start calling you Chainsaw Chris and by the end of the week, everyone's gonna start calling you Chainsaw Chris. Sure enough, somehow he was right, and this near disastrous mistake turned into a nickname that people seemed more than pleased to call me. <laughs> Friends, professors, employers, relatives, even my fiance, who was in my class at Belmont, occasionally looks at me and shakes her head saying, I can't believe I'm marrying Chainsaw Chris. <laughs> me neither, but... Three. Somewhere in 2007, about two years into my country music career, I realized I couldn't sing. <laughs> this, after two years of being surrounded by people who can sing, and made it their daily mission to remind the entire campus that they could. <laughs> Still, though, I was somehow not deterred. Instead, I pivoted, deciding that I could be Nashville famous and make a boatload of money if I became a prominent songwriter. This is how I went on to write such, still available if you're interested, <laughs> hits as Cowboys Make the Best Lovers, Petrosexual, The Car Lover Song, <laughs> and I'm Straight Like George, but I'm Urban Like Keith. <laughs> I was playing a song titled Declaration of Independence that was structurally and lyrically based on the Declaration of Independence <laughs> when an industry friend stopped me and suggested I needed to work on my lyrics. I've got a buddy who was an English major, he said, and now all he does is write lyrics. He's co-written like 12 number ones, has a house in Barbados and everything. Seeing as that's exactly what I wanted, I hung up my guitar and immediately went to my advisor. 
I want to be an English major, I told him. Leaning back in his hair, chair, chewing on his pen, he said, okay, writing emphasis or literature. And because I want to be a writer more than anything, I told him, literature. <laughs> Four, I think the best way to describe my transition to the English department is to say that I was like a gay man who, after 30 years of being in the closet, finally comes out and has to publicly make up for lost time. I basically shouted from the rooftops that I was an English major. I worshipped at the altar of Ernest Hemingway and took to telling everyone there was an underlying text behind everything, no matter what they were looking at. It got even worse when I discovered I could finally understand Mark Twain. Understanding him caused me to try to write like him, which in turn brought me into a Facebook status phase I tried to forget existed. It all culminated in 2010 with a tattoo, a Mark Twain tattoo, 40 words in length from Huck Finn. When I brought it to the artist, I told him I wanted it on my left peck, which she proceeded to laugh at, saying he couldn't write that small. <laughs> well, how big would the text have to be, I asked. He printed it out to show me, and a week later, after much hemming and hawing, I had a quote from Huck Finn tattooed across my entire chest. <laughs> Five. I spent two years writing like a man from the 19th century before I realized I was not a man from the 19th century. <laughs> This panic realization caused me to search for a 21st century equivalent, which is how I discovered David Sedaris and dedicated an entire summer to picking apart his essays. By the end of 2011, it's safe to say I was his biggest fan in the history of the universe. I could compare anything to one of his stories, and when I found one of my professors, Bonnie Smith Whitehouse, got to have dinner with him at Sunset Grill, I was curious as to why I was not invited. <laughs> So when he returned to the Ryman two years later, I immediately reached out to her and began gushing. He's basically Mark Twain to me, I wrote, but gay and still alive. <laughs> Is there any way I, you can get me to meet him? To this, she didn't respond, and I gave up the hope that it wouldn't be possible until two hours before the show. She messaged me to say, you're going to David's show tonight, right? Give me a quick call. I nearly drove off the road as I read this, quickly dialing her number and listening as she said, okay, so my friend is going to introduce you to him. Oh my God, I said, but, she paused, she wants to see your Mark Twain tattoo first. <laughs> I'd never use my body to get things before. But I reasoned that if there was ever a time to start doing it, it was now. Sure, I said, of course, whatever she wants. So an hour later, I was at the Ryman unbuttoning my shirt for a stranger who knew me only as a chainsaw, thanks to my professor's introduction. Okay, so he's going to come out and sign for about 30 minutes before the show, she explained. And we'll just go up to the front of the line, say hi, give him, a, uh, give him something to sign, whatever you want, then move on. I nodded my head, slightly panicking as to what I was going to say to him. Would I play it cool? Would I tell him I was a writer? Would I mention how much I loved the last sentence of his naked essay? I was moments from taking a Xanax when he appeared, and my professor's friend all but grabbed me by the arm and tossed me in front of him. David, she said, this is Chainsaw. <laughs> he looked at me quizzically. Chainsaw. I shook his hand and he took my poster to sign. Yeah, I said, long story, sorry. At this point, I completely resigned to not say anything to my idol ever again. I'd concerned him enough already, no need to put him through any more. Apparently, my professor's friend didn't agree. <laughs> David, she said, Chainsaw wants to show you his chest. <laughs> In the middle of writing something on my poster, he looked up blinking as if to say, he does? <laughs> I turned to her, also confused, and said, I do? <laughs> yeah, show him. And so there I was, unbuttoning my shirt for everyone in God and the literary idol who had shaped my entire career at that point. I stood there awkwardly for a certain 30 seconds or so as he read it, waiting for the inevitable moment. Then he thanked me and whispered to a security guard, keep an eye on that guy. <laughs> but he didn't. At least, not that I know of. Instead, he just nodded, slightly confused, and said, huh. Before sitting back down and signing my poster, chainsaw, nice tattoo. Thank you. How do you even know you were going to tell the story of Chainsaw today? The Lord works in mysterious ways. Speaking of literary inspiration, if you have little people in your life, 
you should know that over here under the stars is our kids section. Uh, little kids, picture books, middle grade stuff, young adult goes all the way over there, so make sure to check that out as well. Uh,